Okay, let's do this. Here we are again in the book of Jeremiah. We're going to hit another two chapters. We're going to roll in and dive in deeper to God's truth, allowing him to just say, here's my heart. Here's who I am. Be empowered in it, walking in it, being full and satisfied by it. So let's do this. Excited. Jeremiah chapters 12 and 13 will be our reading today. So have at it. I know you just hit play, but hit that pause button. Go sit with the Lord. Read Jeremiah 12 and 13. Read and read to learn and read for things to happen and read just standing on his truth, positioning yourself to listen to the Lord. It is so important, guys, that we listen, that we just be still and listen, that we hear his voice, that we rest in him. That, that is so important. That is so that is so powerful when we learn to do that. So Jeremiah chapters 12 and 13, go read. You and God take as long as you need to in order to learn, in order for something to happen, in order for that encounter to be so real with your God. Jeremiah chapters 12 and 13, I'm praying and we're getting this party started. Lord, we just pray that you are here, that you come down, that you pour out, that you just be who you are to each of us. Lord, teach us something in this time. We open ourselves to you and we say, change us and move in us and speak. Lord, we, we are declaring that we are listening. Father, we wanna hear, we wanna hear you. We wanna hear your heart. We wanna hear your voice. We wanna know you. We wanna be so familiar with you. Father, we are choosing to be still so that you can move us. Just teach us something teach us something amazing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's jump into Jeremiah chapter 12. So much in this. We're going through it. We're going to be changed. We're going to learn. We're going to see the heart of God. Okay, Jeremiah starts off right away. First line says, righteous are you, O Lord, that I would plead my case with you. So Jeremiah is approaching the Lord and he is going to talk a little something, something about what's going on. We saw the persecution and things coming up against Jeremiah. Jeremiah has been used, God is speaking this word through him, that he has been speaking nothing but this judgment coming and the severity in it and because of the wickedness and iniquities. And Jeremiah has just been speaking all of this gloom, yet knowing and hearing the heart of God, making it very clear to them that, hey, this is God's desire to save you, to get your attention, to let you know that that he has loved you from the beginning. He has loved you since you were born. Jeremiah is in all of this, speaking this word, and he starts off saying, righteous are you, O Lord. So this isn't, this doesn't turn into a complaining session or a woe is me or why is this happening and this isn't fair. Jeremiah starts right away saying, God, you're righteous. I know who you are. I know you're a righteous God, but that he meets with the Lord and simply asks why, that he seriously wants to know why. And how long will this last? Why does this need to take place? Just continually, you know, working this out with the Lord, but speaking first and foremost, lifting him up, saying, righteous are you, O Lord. Then he speaks in verse two, when he speaks and says, why are they prospering? Why are they doing this? Why is it taken so long for this judgment to come? Why has this much pollution and, and defilement on your land and, and among your people um, happened? So verse two at the end of it, you are near to their lips, but far from their mind. So this is speaking again of the hypocrisy of the people, that they can say all the right things, but their hearts and minds are not surrendered and seeking after the Lord. So Jeremiah is speaking that, saying, I know you're a righteous God, and this is the condition of the people. Why? Why so long? Why? Why just now? Why is all of this happening? Why is it prolonging? Uh, verse 3, but you know me, O Lord. You see me and you examine my heart's attitude toward you. So Jeremiah again saying, God, you're a righteous God. I know who you are and declaring that the righteous will not be forgotten. That's why Jeremiah in his confidence and in his, um, in his gentleness even to the Lord and saying, you're righteous, but just throwing this out, just trying to work this out with the Lord. But he speaks and says, you see me, God, you see me, you see them too. And his not understanding and why all this wickedness is allowed, why these bad things happen and all of this. But Jeremiah says, you know me, oh Lord, you know my heart. You know what I've done. You know how faithful I have been to you. And he speaks this judgment then against them and saying, you are a righteous God. You do see those in righteousness. You do see those in wickedness. Okay, again, just asking how long will this wickedness last? 
Then in verse 5, we see just this charge for Jeremiah and the Lord saying, look, you've got to be faithful in all things. If you can't keep up now with this amount of persecution, then what are you going to do when the judgment actually hits? God is saying this in verses 5 through 6. We see if you have run with footmen and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? If you fall down in a land of peace, how will you do in the thicket of Jordan? Keep your spirits up. Keep your eyes focused. These trials are to develop you for more intensity, more, um, more to come. Prove yourself faithful and allow him to train you for more. What a lesson these verses give us. And God's saying that. Again, it's not to destroy us. It's to develop us. It's to train us for more. We have every reason in the world to remain faithful and to trust the Lord in those difficult times, in the, those moments of pain and suffering and persecution and, and all of that, that we need to say, okay, Lord, you are a righteous God. We are clinging to you. We are keeping our spirits up, not just saying, oh, you know, I know God and he'll do something, but it's okay, God. I don't know what you're doing, but I trust you and I know you're doing something and I'm clinging to that. I'm being steadfast to, um, to you, clinging to you, holding to you and to your truth. So the Lord is just saying, look, look, you got to stick with it. There's more to come. There's more intensity to come. We have no clue what the last days, what all of this, what, how, how our world is going to continue forsaking the Lord, continue walking down this path of destruction. We've got to hold on to the Lord and trust him. We've got to keep our spirits up and choose to see the glory of God, choose to see the goodness of God and run to that, run after more of his righteousness and his holiness. We have got to allow everything that happens in our life that seems uncomfortable, that seems not so fun, we've got to allow that to develop us. And that's what God is after. That's what he's about, training us and developing us for more. So that the more we keep pressing on in and, and sticking, you know, being faithful in, the more of those blessings, the more of his comfort, the more of that intimacy, the more of his power and glory we will come face to face with. The more will be poured out upon us. God just wants us in more. He wants us going after more. He wants us encountering more. And he says in these things, it is never to destroy us. Never, never, ever, ever. It is to develop us. It is to strengthen us. It is to show us more of who he is. Then we hear or see in verse 7, reading through, it's kind of like God and his people, where he says, I have forsaken my house and I have abandoned my inheritance. I have given the be beloved of my soul into the hand of her enemies. And this is because of the wickedness that everything that God has purposed and, and had planned to do in us and for us, that he had to give it away because the people forsook him, turned away from him, they rejected him. Jumping down to verse 10, many shepherds have ruined my vineyard. They have trampled down my field. They have made my pleasant field a desolate wilderness. All that God has established, this promised land for his people and saying, this is your inheritance. This is your land. This is where you can dwell in peace. This is where you can be and have freedom and, and life to the full. Where God said, so many, my shepherds, these leaders of my people, they came and they ruined it. They, they trampled, they trampled on it, ruined my vineyard and my field. That God took such care and detail in placing us, he does, in placing us in position to grow and to be developed, to have more of him. And, um, and when we come in in our wickedness, when Israel and Judah, when, when they just did their own thing in their own way and, and these leaders rose up and they were all about themselves and what they could, how they could benefit, how they could get, you know, better and more and powerful and, and rich and all of this. It was this wickedness that defiled everything that God had built and planted and established and set in order and caused to grow. That, that, that their wickedness came in and trampled all this down, ruined and destroyed everything that God had planned. Everything, though God is faithful, we in our wickedness, we come in and that's what happens. All these blessings, we just trample them. We just rip them to shreds by the way that we live and choosing not to seek the Lord, not to focus on him, not to trust him. Uh, verse 11, it has been made a desolation, desolate it mourns before me. The whole land has been made desolate because no man lays it to heart. Um, it says then in verse 12, a sword of the Lord is devouring. Verse 13, they have sown wheat and have reaped thorns. 
they have strained themselves to no profit, but be ashamed of your harvest because the fierce anger of the Lord. They strained them to no profit. It's striving in vain. It's going after things that bring no satisfaction, that bring no peace. They bring no life. They bring, they bring nothing good. They've strained themselves to no profit. It's all in vain. And they end up exhausted and discouraged and, and feeling yuck and heavy and, and wounded and, and just messed up. That's what we do. That's what happens when we choose to turn away from the Lord, just straining ourselves, going after all this nonsense. It gets us nowhere. Nothing. Pursuing anything other than the Lord will get us nowhere. It's all in vain. It, it holds no purpose, no value, no nothing. We all have a harvest coming. We see this, but be ashamed of your harvest. God is speaking this in regards to their wickedness. Because of the fierce anger of the Lord, be ashamed of your harvest. We all have a harvest coming. We all do. Will we delight in it through our righteousness or will we be shamed in it because of our wickedness? Which, which will it be? That A harvest is coming. The way we live, there will be a harvest that comes. Will we be ashamed of it? Will we be just living in shame of it, knowing that this harvest, that, that we've just spun our wheels, everything's in vain, nothing matters, but we find ourselves in captivity, bound up, lost and confused, alone and miserable? Or will we find delight in this harvest that comes because of our righteousness? Because we've chosen to, to stand in, to be settled in, to be still in, the one who holds all power, the one who gives life, the one who is peace, the one who brings love and loves us and allows us to love in a real beautiful kind of way. It's either we're going to be shamed of it or delighting in it. Verse 14, thus says the Lord concerning all my wicked neighbors who strike at the inheritance with each with which I have endowed my people Israel. Behold, I'm about to uproot them. We see in verse 15, uh, verse 15 and it will come about that after I have uprooted them, I will again have compassion on them and I will bring them back, each one to his inheritance and each one to his land. So again, the Lord's response of compassion and justice, of this judgment coming in, but compassion and this restoration that is to follow. Verse 16, then if they will really learn the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, they will be built up in the midst of my people. So the Lord is saying, if they really learn my ways, if they're being authentic, if they're being surrendered, if they truly seek me with such fervency, with such passion, with such heart and, and just investing and in their minds and everything, the way that they did worship other things, worship the Baals. If they turn from that and seek me, seek me with that and so much more with their whole hearts, all their minds, their strength, everything. If they come seeking me, if they come in repentance to me and that humility to me, truly desiring and wanting me, that they truly learn the ways. Learn. If they will really learn the ways of my people, then the Lord says that they will be built up in the midst of my people. That God says, anyone who turns to me, anyone who, who takes... Um, who chooses, makes this decision to come in and listen to the Lord, to learn, to be developed, to grow in this, to seek Him, to be empowered by Him, to remain in Him. Whoever does that, whoever comes, whoever is drawn in, whoever responds to the Lord's response of such compassion and of such drawing, whoever responds to that will be built up, built up among His people among those who are living wickedly, among those who are seeking Him, in all of it, they will be built up. Those who ever, God is a faithful God, whoever turns to him, whoever seeks the Lord, whoever trusts him, they will be built up. Verse 17, but if they will not listen, then I will uproot that nation, uproot and destroy it, declares the Lord. If they will not listen. Again, we saw in the last couple chapters how the Lord came in. We see in chapter 11, verse 7 at the end, it says, even to this day, warning persistently saying, Listen to my voice. God is saying, be quiet, be still, listen to me speak. Let it be real, let it sink in, listen. Listen, we can only listen, we can only hear. We can only become familiar with his voice if we are still. And the Lord says, but if they will not listen, then I will uproot that nation, uproot and destroy it that that will be their end, that judgment is coming, that they will miss out by saying, we're not listening, 
then they won't hear the beautiful sounds of God's mercy and compassion and goodness and salvation and blessing. They won't hear it. And and that, that sound, the beauty of that sound, the power of that sound, the depth of that sound is like a sound no other. No, that, that a sound that we would never, never even, even dream of being able to listen to here on this earth. It is a sound that is heavenly and, and divine. Absolutely beautiful. Let's carry on into chapter 13. Thus the Lord said to me, so the Lord is speaking to Jeremiah and commands him to do this thing. It says, go and buy yourself a linen waistband and put it around your waist, but do not put it in the water. So verses one through like 10, God gives Jeremiah this crazy instruction and tells him to do this. We see to go and buy yourself a linen. So here's the commands and just listing them out. This is what God says in these first few chapters to Jeremiah. Go and buy a waistband. That's what he says. Buy a waistband, like a belt, a linen waistband, a linen belt. And then he says, wear it. I want you to wrap it around your waist. He says, do not put it in the water. Then he says, take it off. After some time, you've wore it. It's, it's been your honor. It's, it's like a sign of royalty, of something that you can be proud of, something that brings glory. Then he says, okay, now take it off, take the waistband off, and hide it in the crevice of a rock at the Euphrates. So we see that in verse um, verse six, hide it in a crevice of a rock. Then we see after many days, the Lord tells him, okay, go get your waistband now. Go to where you hid it, where do you where you stuffed it in the, the crevice of the rock. Go get it. And we see that in um, verse seven, that I went to the Euphrates and dug and I took the waistband from the place where I had hidden it. And lo, the waistband was ruined. It was totally worthless. Verse eight, then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Verse 9 says, Thus says the Lord, Just so will I destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. This wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts and have gone after other gods to serve them and to bow down to them, let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. It was ruined. It was shoved in the a, a crevice of a rock. He came after many days, found this, lifted it up. It was ruined. It was, it was shredded. It was destroyed. It was worthless is what the word says. Totally worthless. And the Lord said that these people who did not listen, his people who he chose, who did not listen, who, who did not trust him, who did not seek him, walked in the stubbornness of their own hearts, bowed down and served other gods, put so much their, of their thoughts and their hearts and their minds and, and investing in these other things, spending more time in these things, lifting them up as most important to them in these things, that those, those men and women, those people, those children of his that he chose, that he called out his people, God's people, those who do that, that they would be totally worthless totally destroyed, totally ruined. Verse 11, for as the waistband clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole household of Israel and the whole household of Judah cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people for renown, for praise and for glory. But they did not listen. We see that God created them for and with a purpose. It says to cling to him. We were created to cling to our creator, to know and be connected to our creator because all of our worth, all of our identity, all of our beauty, all of our strength, all of everything within us is only activated. It's only alive and present and actually working in our lives if we are connected to the one who created us with those things and in those things. That's our purpose. That's, that's our identity. That's where we're found in the Lord. He created us to cling to him, to wrap around him, to be wrapped up in him, around his waist like that waistband wrapped in him. And we were created for, it says for renown, for praise, for glory, but they didn't listen. They wanted nothing to do with it. They, they removed themselves from the Lord. And, and went and hid and went and walked in their own ways and went and, you know, as far away. They plugged their ears. They, they boarded up their hearts. They, they, you know, blinded themselves with their eyes and saying, no, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to know. We don't want the conviction. We don't want the growth. We don't want the pain. We're going to go out and live our own lives. We're going to have fun. We're going to, you know, we're going to focus on, on, on our own selves and our own happiness and, and all this and that. You know, when we take that waistband off and, and we chuck it, you know, we just take it, remove it take it off, we're ruined. It, it's, it's ruined when we disconnect ourselves from the Lord and walk away 
and, and, and go hide and go live our lives the way we want to outside of, of how God is calling us. And, you know, we don't want to hear him calling us because we're afraid of what he's going to call us to do. When we do that, we remove ourselves, we disconnect ourselves, and we ruin ourselves. We destroy ourselves. We remove ourselves from all the goodness that the Lord had planned. With that then, and his saying, but they did not listen. Then he speaks um, to Jeremiah to speak to them and saying, every jug is to be filled with wine. We see in verse 13, behold, I'm about to fill all the inhabitants of this land. And he speaks the kings, the priests, the prophets, the inhabitants of the land. We see that all in verse 13 with drunkenness, that they will be filled with drunkenness. In this state where they reject the Lord, that, that they're going to be walking around drunk, worthless, worthless, ruined, stumbling over things with no focus, with no drive, with no passion, with no, with, with no steadiness, with no security, with no wisdom, with no honor, with no respect. Just God is saying you're going to be filled with drunkenness. If that's what you're choosing, if that's what, if, if that's what you want, then that's what you're going to have. Everything apart from me as you disconnect yourselves to me. Verse 14, I will dash them against each other, both the fathers and the sons together, declares the Lord. I will not show pity, nor be sorry, nor have compassion so as not to destroy them. So the Lord says, look, I'm not going to have compassion. I'm not going to have pity. I'm coming and I'm going to destroy. Now, we've been reading that God, it's not in his heart, his desire to destroy. It's to develop. It's to save. It's to draw us in. It's to wake us up. It's to get us led into repentance. So I had to look up this word and I had to figure out what was going on because he said, no, I am coming to destroy. It is one. I'm not going to have compassion. I'm not going to have pity. And we know that that goes against God's character to spare wickedness. I mean, that's got to be removed. That's got to be wiped out. So we see this, you know, could very easily be, hey, that's the destruction and wiping it out. But I had to look up this word destroy. And this is the Hebrew word of destroy in verse 14. It's the word shacha. This word means to decay, to ruin, to cast off, and to corrupt. So this word decay, to decay. So he is saying to decay them, that, that they will be decayed. So in this, I had to look up just the general definition then of decay. And it's to rot or, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> Woo! to rot or decompose through the action of bacteria or fungi. So I'm thinking, okay, decay, to rot or decompose. That this word means that God says, okay, he's going to come in and he's going to decay them. That they will be decayed. To decay, um, you know, to ruin, to cast off, corrupt. Decay meaning to rot or decompose. So I'm thinking, okay, tooth decay, right? Like that's just what I think, tooth decay. Tooth decay can lead to a small hole in the tooth. And if it's not treated, it can cause serious pain, infection, um, or even tooth loss, that, that you may even lose a tooth. So I'm thinking, okay, tooth decay. It, you know, it can turn into a tiny, tiny hole. If it's not treated, if it's not taken care of, it can cause this pain. It can cause infection. It can infect. So just thinking, this decay. We choose decay. When, when we choose to turn away from the Lord, that's the path that we're going after. But the Lord, thinking of his judgment, meaning mercy, how we've spoken throughout his word, his judgment comes in to decay them to decay them, to cause a hole, to cause a hole so that we are awakened to, hey, we need treatment. We need help. This hurts. This is painful. This infects us. It puts on a weight. It, it causes so many ugh, emotions. It truly does. So this, um, this hole, and we think of, okay, treatment. So if it's not treated, it causes this pain and this infection. So treatment, um, treatment for tooth decay. It includes, it can include fluoride and fillings and crowns. And I wrote all these down, a root canal or even removal. So to treat this decay, what needs to take place? Okay. I immediately think of fillings. Like when we get tooth decay or we get a cavity, it, we need to go to the dentist. They need to pretty much dig that out, get rid of all that stuff and fill it up with all the good, fill it up so that it's safe, that it's protected, that it's, that that's, that's the healing of it that it's, it's dug out, that hole is present, it's felt, and we are in need of a dentist or the dentist or the physician in this hole. Sometimes a hole needs to be exposed. Sometimes that decay that, that the Lord even brings on, that he will decay us, that he will allow this decay to happen for us to be 
awakened for us to come into repentance that we see and know that this is the heart of God for this to happen, for this judgment to come down for us to be awakened. It's a wake up call for us to see it as God's mercy so that we have the opportunity to run and return to the Lord. So sometimes a hole needs to be exposed so that healing can begin so that we can be cleaned out and filled up with all the good, that all that junk can be removed and we can be filled up with all the good that will, that will feel better. In the long run, it'll feel better because it reaches within. It's not this surfacey, oh, I'm fine, I'm great, I'm happy, you know, everything, pursuing all of this surfacey stuff. It's God wants to get deep. He wants to clean it out. He wants to find that hole, clean it out, and fill it up with all the good. It's removing the cavity, removing the K, and you fill her up. You let God fill us up. How many times are we reaching out and seeking the, the world to fill us up, to make us feel better? You know, going after, let's find happiness, let's find love, let's find all of this from the world. When God says, no, you go after that and you're going to decay. That's what's going to happen. It's going to decay you and you're going to find all these holes where you're never feeling filled up. You're never feeling satisfied. The little that you get, you just want more and more to try to keep up. It's this striving and it's all... It's all in vain. So that decay, again, we see the heart of God that he will come in and decay us. He will ruin us. He will cast off. That word cast off and corrupt. That we will be so corrupted that there are holes that we see, that we recognize that we need something more. We need something deeper. We need something a little more real, a little more legit. And the Lord in that saying, look, I got the tools. I got the tools to come in to clean you out and to fill you up with all, with all the good. Okay, with that, let's go to verse 15. Listen and give heed and do not be haughty. Right there, the Lord says, listen to me. Give heed to my words and my commandments and do not be proud. Do not lift yourself up. Verse 16, give glory to the Lord your God before he brings darkness and before your feet stumble on the dusky mountains and while you are hoping for light, he makes it into deep darkness and turns it into gloom. So God gives yet another warning. He is constantly warning his people because it's his desire not to destroy, but to bring us back to him, to save us, to, to pour mercy out upon us, to allow us to find freedom in him. Then we see in verse 17, but if you will not listen to it, my soul will sob in secret for such pride. So Jeremiah is declaring the brokenness of his heart for Judah as they continue, when they continue, if they continue to not listen. Let's jump down to verse 19. The cities of the Negev have been locked up and there is no one to open them. All Judah has been carried into exile, wholly carried into exile. So Jeremiah is speaking this word from the Lord saying, look, exile is coming. Captivity is coming. It's on. It's going to happen. There's no escaping it because you continue to not listen. Verse 20, lift up your eyes and see those coming from the north. Again, speaking of Babylon, um, the Babylonian empire, Babylon coming and, and being those who seized Jerusalem and eventually take them into captivity. Verse 22, if you say in your heart, why have these things happened to me? Because of the magnitude of your iniquity, your skirts have been removed and your heels have been exposed. Let's jump down to verse 25. This is your lot, the portion measured to you from me, declares the Lord, because you have forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. So I myself have also stripped your skirts off your face that your shame may be seen. Verse 27, we'll finish up with this. As for your adulteries and your lustful neighings, the lewdness of your prostitution on the hills and the field, I have seen your abominations. Woe to you, O Jerusalem. How long will you remain unclean? And we've got to read those verses and not thinking, oh, well, I've never committed adultery and, and I've never, you know, I'm not caught up in all the lustful whatever. And I'm not, you know, the lewdness of your prostitution. Well, I'm not prostituting myself out. Guys, it's easy to read that and just disregard because it's like, oh, we haven't done this and that and that, and I'm not caught up in that sin. But this is just screaming. It's symbolizing all of sin. It's symbolizing even the smallest sin, like that small hole. Like tooth decay can be a tiny, tiny hole. That's all it takes, a tiny little bit of sin. And we've got to see this as not, oh, the huge, the huge sins, the sins that everyone can see and call out and are super obvious. No, this is sin and sin in general. And knowing that the smallest white lie, the smallest bit of jealousy, the smallest bit of, of bitterness that we still hold on to because someone hurt us or someone did us wrong, those tiny little things can cause that decay. It is that decay. And those tiny little things need, they need to be recognized. They need to be faced. They need to be repented of. And they need 
they, they show us our need for a savior to come in and to clean us out so that we can be filled up. But the Lord says, how long will you remain unclean? God is calling us out and saying, look, this is serious. Who's going to listen? Listen and, and heed, heed me, heed my commandments, heed the things that I am saying and don't be proud. Come to me in repentance and humility and watch what I can do. Watch how I can heal you. Watch what I can give you. Watch what I can bless or how I can bless you. Watch what it was supposed to be. Like, let me show you the life that you are supposed to be living in. Yet in our wickedness and our iniquities, we come in and our selfishness and just being self-absorbed or not caring or not, not passionately seeking the Lord. We just, we just lie then in ruins. It's, it's all in vain. It brings nothing, no goodness, no anything. But God, God has established so much for us. And so subtly, so many times, even so blatantly, we've walked away from it. And God says, how long will you remain unclean? Good news is we know God. We know his heart. And we know that he is all about us coming back to him in salvation and repentance. There's nothing that we can do that, that makes us too far gone. There, our sin is not more powerful than his grace. And we've got to remember that. The second that we turn to the Lord and seek him and come to him in repentance and rest and humility, then the Lord says, hey, salvation is given. That, that's, that's when you receive it, when you come to me in repentance and humility. So, so good. The heart of God, again, all over it. Uh, the hope that we have, the truth that he just pours out in his word. How long will you be unclean? Let's be aware. Let's recognize. Let's allow ourselves to be exposed. Let's let those tiny little holes, let's let God come in and do the work. Let's let him, you know, fill us up with all the good stuff, with all that he is. Let's go after more. Loving this, loving this journey. Thanks for joining me. Cannot wait for more. Cannot wait for what God has us. This is just the beginning. It always is. Everything that we learn and grow in and, and recognize um, and discover, it's just the beginning. There's so, so much more. So let's continue to go after more. I'll see you soon on my next video.